Hello everyone, this is Dr. Matsy Howard again, and welcome to Business 255. We are now in week five. Uh, this week, we're going to be covering one variable and two variable ANOVA. Uh, so, so far in this class, we've covered chi-square, we've covered one sample t-test, two sample t-test. Uh, so now we're moving on to one variable ANOVA, which if I remember correctly, is one of the last analyses we'll do that compares the differences between groups before moving on to analyses that looks at the relationship between variables. Uh, so this one will be very similar to what we've been doing in prior weeks, and then next week, I believe, is the start, and we're going to be covering some uh, new and different type of things. So let's go ahead and get started. So what is an ANOVA? Why do we care about ANOVA? Why don't we just use t-test and chi-square tests for everything? Well, no the textbook definition for an ANOVA is it's used to analyze the differences among group means and their associated procedures. So at first, that's a textbook definition, it's a little bit confusing, but it might sound a lot like a t-test because it is a lot like a t-test. However, how an ANOVA differs from a t-test is whereas a t-test just looks at the difference between two groups, an ANOVA is used to test whether the means of a measured variable in more than two groups are significantly different. So in a t-test, we would have one group, we might have two groups. For an ANOVA, it's anything more than two groups. So if you're ever wanting to compare the difference of three, four, five, maybe even 20 groups, you're going to be using an ANOVA. So t-test, one or two groups, an ANOVA, more than two groups. Simple as that, just remember that. So for example, some questions we might answer with an ANOVA, these are very similar to what we did for a t-test but you'll see there's a slight difference. So if we wanted to know which class has the highest test scores or which class has a significantly higher test score between Dr. Howard, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Kim, we could use an ANOVA. Why would that be an ANOVA? It's because we have three groups. T-test is just for two groups. ANOVA is for more than two. If we had a question of are people with brown, black, or red hair the tallest, once again we have three groups, so we'd be doing an ANOVA. And then if we had the question, which training group performed the best, the no training group, the old training group, or the new training group, as you guessed, we would use an ANOVA because there's three groups there. And then if we had the question, which company has the highest employee satisfaction out of Walmart, Target, Sears, or JCPenney, once again, we would use an ANOVA because we have four groups there. Uh, we have four groups, and also this is important to note, uh, in each of these, we have a separate outcome. We have a separate measured variable for our outcome. So in the first example, we have our grouping variable, which is classroom. We have three of those, but then we have test scores, which is our outcome. The second one, we have our grouping variable of hair color, which had three groups, but our outcome is height, so we have a separate outcome. The third one, we have three groups that are the training groups, and our outcome was performance. And then the last one, we had different companies. We had four different companies, which was our grouping variable, and then we have a separate measured outcome, which is employee satisfaction. So if you're wanting to compare more than two groups on some type of a measured outcome, you're going to be using an ANOVA. Okay, so to go back to this chart, we've been coming back to over and over and over again. So we're still on the right side of this chart. We're still explaining the difference between groups. We're still looking at how the outcome is gauged, and we still have a continuous outcome. We're still looking at something we measured and comparing groups based on something we measured like height, like performance, like job satisfaction, whatever it is, it's something that we measured. And now we have more than two groups, so we're going to be doing an ANOVA. So we're explaining the difference between groups, we have a continuous outcome, and we have more than two groups. So we're going to be doing an ANOVA. Okay, so once again, an ANOVA is used to test whether the means of a measured variable in more than two groups are significantly different. So when performing an ANOVA, our hypotheses are usually the null hypothesis, is that there's no difference in the mean, means of the groups. So usually our null, null hypothesis is that there is no difference in the means of our groups. Whereas our hypothesis, or the alternative hypothesis, is there is indeed a difference in the mean of the groups. There is indeed a difference in the means of the groups. So the null that we want to try to reject is that there's no difference, and our hypothesis that we want to try to support is that there is indeed a difference. So we perform an ANOVA to determine whether we can reject the null hypothesis. 
and we're still going to be using p-values. Like I said, the very first uh, lesson of the semester, we're going to be coming back to this p-value over and over and over and over again. So if you're still struggling with p-values, please go back and watch that first lecture video. Please go back and watch the week one video, watch the week two and three introduction video, because I talk about p-values in those videos also, because they're important. As always, if p is less than 0.05, we reject the null and we support our hypothesis. We say there is a significant effect. And if p is greater than 0.05, we cannot reject the null. So we say that you cannot support a significant effect. You cannot claim that something is statistically significant if your p is greater than 0.05. So how do we perform an ANOVA? As you probably already guessed, we're going to be using Excel. Um, everything we covered this semester, also uh, everything that we have covered so far, and pretty much everything we will cover, is very basic statistics, by the way. Uh, we're gonna, we learn how to do them in ANOVA, but pretty much any stats program can do these analyses, including uh, things like SPSS, SAS, R. So if you're trying to use any other statistical programs for this course, you can do an ANOVA. That's not going to be anything crazy, uh, not anything that's out there for typical statistical programs. Okay, so when doing an ANOVA, our data set might look like this. In this example, we have group one, we have group two, and we have group three in three separate columns, and we measured them on something. So let's say this is job performance. So we measured the job performance of group one, we measured the job performance of group two, and we measured the job performance of group three. And that's where they're at in those three columns. As always, we're going to go to data analysis, and when you're doing a one variable ANOVA, you're going to be doing a single factor. Once again, when you're doing a one variable ANOVA, you're going to be doing a single factor ANOVA. So if you just have one variable, if you have one grouping variable, sorry, yeah, that's the best way to put it. If you have one grouping variable such as height, or sorry, such as hair color, uh, such as what school you went to, such as what company you work for. If it's just one grouping variable, it's a one variable ANOVA, and you're going to be doing a NOVA single factor. As always, we're going to have to tell uh, Excel where our data is, so we're going to click on that button. We're going to highlight our data, and as you'll notice, uh, this is something that I think may have, may have confused some people before, I'm not sure, uh, but as you'll notice in this example, I did not highlight the labels at the top. So I highlighted just my data, and then I push OK. And then since I did not highlight my labels, I do not have to click that labels in the first row button. If I did highlight those labels, I would have to click on labels in the first row. And if you want your results to have those labels in the results, then highlight that when you highlight your data and click on labels in the first row. Once again, if you want your output to actually include those labels, highlight those labels when you highlight your data that we just now did in the prior slide, and then in this window, click on labels in first row. However, in this example that, we're sh that I'm showing you right now, I did not highlight those labels. I did not highlight those labels when I was highlighting my data. So therefore, I did not click on labels in first row. If you mess that up, it's going to give you different results, so it's important to know when you should or should not click that button. I think it's kind of self-explanatory. If you highlighted the labels, you tell it you highlighted the labels. If you didn't highlight the labels, you leave it unchecked. You do not tell it you highlighted the labels. So there you go. Then if we did that correctly, you push OK. And it will give you this output. Um, as you can see in the top right here, it just gives you the summary descriptive statistics of those three groups. So the data that we had in column one had an average score of 1.9. The data that we had in column 2 had an average score of 4.9, and the data that we had in column 3 had an average score of 7.9. And then at the bottom, it gives us our actual ANOVA results. That's a lot of information down there, but the important things you need to know are the F statistic. So the F statistic is the test statistic you get from your ANOVA. It's the test statistic you get from running your ANOVA, and you need to report that. You need to tell people, this was my F statistic. However, as the t-statistic, as the chi-square statistic, it's pretty hard to interpret on its own. So therefore, we need to look at the p-value. And in this example, you see that the p-value was 4.8 e to the negative 14. So we covered this before in this class, but as you hopefully remember, if you see something in Excel that's a number with e to the negative 14 afterwards, that just means you're supposed to uh, move that decimal point 14 times to the left. 
So in this example, that would mean we would uh, make it decimal and then 13 zeros and then 4, 8. Um, so as you can guess, and we'll see on the next slide, the T statistic was 117. The P value was incredibly small. That's almost as small as you can possibly imagine for a P value. And as you can see, the p-value was obviously less than 0.05. Because it was so incredibly small, it was less than 0.05. So from this, can we reject the null? Hopefully by now you've answered that correctly. Yes, we can reject the null. The p-value is less than 0.05. We can reject the null. Whenever p is less than 0.05, we can reject the null. And our results are statistically significant when the p is less than 0.05. So we don't have to use any tables like we did for chi-square because Excel does this for us. Excel automatically gives us our p-value. It automatically gives us that number and we can easily tell whether it's greater than or less than 0.05. Okay. So can we say that there's a significant difference among the groups in regards to their mean test scores? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the, the, we saw a significant overall difference. Our ANOVA was statistically significant, so therefore we know that there's some type of difference in our groups. If our NOVA is overall statistically significant, we know that there are, our groups differ somehow, some way, some shape, some form. However, one thing ANOVA doesn't directly tell us is which group performed better. So as we looked at before, we knew that the group 1 had a smaller mean, group 2 had the mean in the middle, and group 3 had the mean that was higher. But how do we know if those comparisons are significant? How do we know if 1 is significantly higher than 2? How do we know if 2 is significantly less than 3? And how do we know if 3 is significantly higher than 1? So our ANOVA told us that there's an overall difference. This overall difference is statistically significant. But how do we know if those individual comparisons are significant? 1 versus 2, 2 versus 3, and 1 versus 3? Well, we can't know that just by looking at the means. We can't know that just by looking at the means. So to identify whether these individual comparisons are significant, so to know whether 1 is different than 2, 2 is different than 3, and 3 is different than 1, we need to do something called post hoc tests. So post hoc tests are called that because they come after the ANOVA. So first you do the ANOVA. If that's significant, you know there's some type of difference among the groups. And then you've got to do post hoc tests to figure out, well, what is that difference? What drove that significance? What group was significantly different than the others? And how did they uh, differ in shape or form? To do that, we do post hoc tests. So unfortunately, Excel doesn't do post hoc tests, or at least I don't know of an easy way to do it in Excel. I'm sure there is a way you could program it yourself, but I'm not going to make you do that. That would be incredibly difficult and honestly a waste of your time. So what we're going to do in this class is there's a certain type of post hoc test called 2K's HSD, Highest Significant Difference. A person named 2K decades upon decades ago made this post hoc test. I think it's rel relatively easy, I think it's useful, um, and we're going to use that to determine whether the individual group comparisons are significant. So we're going to apply 2K's HSD post hoc test to determine whether these individual group comparisons are significant. Um, like I said, Excel will not do it for you, so in the purposes of this class, I'm actually going to give you the 2K's output. I'm going to give you the 2K's HSD results. So in this class, I'm going to make you do the ANOVA. I'm going to make you determine whether there's an overall significant difference, and then every time I'm going to give you this table, and you're going to have to learn how to read this table to figure out whether these group comparisons were significant. So pretty much, once again, all I'm saying is whenever we do an ANOVA, you'll do the ANOVA, you'll find out whether the ANOVA is statistically significant, and then if it is, or sometimes if it's not, I'll still give you this table. Um, and then you'll have to learn how to read this table, uh, to figure out whether the group comparison was significant. And this table came from a stats program called SPSS. It's probably one of the more popular stats programs after Excel, um, at least for a lot of applied purposes, so it's good for you to learn how to just generally understand the output of SPSS. So let's look at this table. So this table, um, on the left hand side, you'll see the groups that each row is comparing. So on this table, the first uh, row has the number 1 and the number 2. So all this is saying on that left hand side is the first row is comparing the difference between group 1 versus group 2. So this very top row, as you can see on the left hand side, is comparing 1 versus 2, group 1 versus group 2. And then if we go over to where that SIG column is, that SIG column is just giving you the p-value. 
the significance column is just giving you the p-value. So as you can see in this column, the p-value is actually 0 .000. It's actually rounding down because it's so small. So what this row is telling you is that the difference between group 1 and group 2 had a p-value of close to 0 .000. So is that statistically significant? Think about it for a sec. Yes, it was. So it's less than 0.05. That p-value is less than 0.05. So that comparison, that first row between group 1 and group 2, had a p-value of less than 0.05. So therefore, based on this post hoc test, we can say there's a significant difference between group 1 and 2. We can say there's a significant difference between group 1 and 2 based on this post hoc test. So our NOVA at first said there's a significant overall difference. And then we just looked at the post hoc test and we see that there's not only an overall difference, but there's a significant difference between group 1 and group 2. Okay, let's look at the next row. The next row still has the number 1 right there, and then we have the number 3. So this next row is comparing group 1 versus group 3. And we go back to that SIG column that gives us the p-value. So once again, it's 0, .000. So is there a significant difference between group 1 and 3? Hopefully you said the answer is yes there is a significant difference between group 1 and 3. That p-value is less than 0.05, so therefore you can say there is a significant difference between group 1 and group 3. So that so far we found a significant overall effect, the ANOVA was significant, we found a post-hoc significant difference between 1 and 2, and then we just now found a post-hoc significant difference between 1 and 3. And then the very last one we want to look at is on the fourth row actually. The fourth row compares group 2 and group, group 3. So we already did 1 versus 2, we already did 1 versus 3, now we're comparing 2 versus 3. And as you can see in that SIG column, it's 0, .000, so we're comparing 2 and 3, and was that statistically significant? Once again, I hope you said yes, that is less than 0.05, so we can say there's a significant difference between group 2 and 3 that P was less than 0.05, so there was indeed a statistically significant difference between group 2 and group 3. So we would say that that result was statistically significant. So in this example from running this ANOVA, we had an overall significant ANOVA effect, which was the analysis we ran in Excel, and we could say there's a significant difference in the group means. Then from looking at that table, we saw that there's a significant difference uh, or sorry, that one was significantly different than group two. So group one was significantly different than group two. Group one was also significantly different than group three. And then also group two was significantly different than group three. So not only was there a significant overall difference in the group means, but each group also significantly differed than the other. That's not always gonna happen. This is kind of a special case where they all happen to differ. So don't think that's always gonna happen if there's a significant difference in the group means. Um, however, just be aware it could happen, that we do these post hoc tests to make sure that those individual comparisons were indeed statistically significant. There was indeed a significant difference in those group comparisons. Okay. So if you have any questions about that, please pause this video, please send me an email. Um, but that's all we're going to cover for one variable ANOVA. One variable ANOVA is pretty straightforward. If you understood the two sample t-test, then you should understand a one variable ANOVA. It's pretty much the same thing, you're just using more than two groups, and you're having to do those post hoc comparisons. Uh, so if you didn't get that, pause the video, maybe rewatch it, uh, maybe go ahead and check out the guide that's, uh, that I sent you, and it's also in the description of this video. But otherwise, uh, we're going to go ahead and continue. Okay, so still Business 255, still Week 5. Now we're going to cover two variable ANOVA. Now we're going to cover the two variable ANOVA. So what is a two variable ANOVA? Uh, sorry, I have this animation. There we go. Uh, so as we already know, an ANOVA is used to test whether the means of a measured variable in more than two groups are significantly different. Uh, so that's still the definition of ANOVA. We're still applying that definition. We're still going to have more than two groups. But now the question is, what if we have more than one grouping variable? So before when we did a t-test, we just had two groups. Then we did a one variable ANOVA and we had more than two groups. And in this example, we're gonna have more than one grouping variable. So each grouping variable by default 
has to have at least two groups in it, so we're going to have more than one grouping variable. Uh, so this might have two variables, each with two groups, which would make a total of four groups. We might have two grouping variables. One has two groups, the other has three groups, and that would cause it to have six groups. So on and so on, you get it. So therefore, what if we have more than one grouping variable? Uh, so some examples of this might be if we're looking at differences in height and gender by, or sorry, if we're looking at differences in height by gender and ethnicity. Uh, so we have a grouping variable of gender, we have a grouping variable of ethnicity, and we have a measured outcome of height. So we could see if there's a difference based on gender and ethnicity, and as we'll discuss in a little bit, we can also test for an interaction between those two in regards to height. So we might also be looking at the differences in GPA by major and academic year. So in this one, our grouping variable could be major. We could have a lot of different majors. We could have academic year, which would be freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And then we could have a measured outcome of GPA. And we could test to see whether there are indeed differences in GPA by major, whether there's differences in GPA by academic year, and then also whether there's an interaction between those two. And then the last example that I'll mention is differences in company revenue by location and business type. So we could have location, something like East Coast versus West Coast. We could have business type like blue collar versus white collar. And then we could compare those company revenues. So location would have two groups, business type would have two groups. So therefore we have a total of four groups. Okay, so whenever we do an ANOVA with two variables, whenever we do a two variable ANOVA, uh, we can use an ANOVA to determine the group differences for variable one. So if it's that business type, it could be white collar versus blue collar, and we could determine whether there's a difference between those two. We could use an ANOVA to determine the group differences for variable two. So this could be location, east coast versus west coast, and we could make a comparison to see if there's a difference on east coast versus west coast. But what if we know, want to know whether there's an interaction effect also? What if we, what if we want to know whether there's an interaction? And of course, the first question you're going to ask yourself is what is an interaction effect? An interaction effect is when the effect of one variable depends on the other and vice versa. An interaction effect is when the effect of one variable depends on the other and vice versa. So it might, be, it might not be necessarily the effect of variable one, it might not necessarily be the effect of variable two, but the true thing that's happening, the true effect that we're observing, is the effect of variable one and variable two coming together to produce something different. That it's not just one, it's not just the other, but it's when the both of them come together and produce something different. And you can test that with an ANOVA. So you can test the effect of one grouping variable, you can test the effect of the other grouping of variable, and you can see if when they're combined, if something special and something different happens. So what are the some examples of interaction effects? Uh, so it might be the case that your SAT score or your major doesn't independently have an effect on GPA, that those might not have a relationship with GPA, but they might have an effect when analyzed together. It might be that certain people with certain SAT scores and certain majors actually have crazy high GPAs, or everyone else has pretty normal GPAs. And you might not be able to test that if you just had SAT. You might not be able to test that if you just had major. But when you test both of those together and you're able to identify people with certain SAT scores and certain majors have those crazy unusual GPAs, that's when you have an interaction effect, or that's when you could have an interaction effect. Another example is when gender or age, uh, they might have an effect on height when studied independently, but they might have a stronger effect when analyzed together. So it might not necessarily, or it might have an effect somewhat when you have males versus females on height. You might have an effect somewhat when it's uh, young versus old on height. When you study those two things together on height, it might have a stronger effect. So it might be that old men have a much, much, much uh, higher height than all the other groups. And you couldn't uh, isolate that effect of older men unless you're looking at those two together. So therefore, um, gender might have somewhat of an effect age might have somewhat of an effect, but when you look at those two together, you isolate a certain group, you isolate a certain effect, that then you can study together, and that might be what's driving your observed results. So what might an interaction effect look like? So let's look at some examples. 
So an interaction effect might look like this. You might be looking at GPA as a function of major and academic year. So as you can see, the co it's color coded. Freshmen and sophomore are blue, and junior and seniors are orange. So as you can see, all the groups are pretty equal. They have the same height. So when you're looking at non-business students, they all have a GPA of two, no matter what, no matter if they're freshmen and sophomores or junior and senior. However, when you look at the business students, the freshmen and sophomores had the same height of all the other ones. However, it was juniors and seniors in business that had this crazy high GPA. So it wasn't necessarily just the effect of business versus non-business. It wasn't necessarily just the effect of freshman and sophomore versus junior and senior, but it really was this isolated effect of junior and senior business students that were higher than everyone else. And that's something we can get into. That's something we can test with a two variable ANOVA that since we're studying these two grouping variables at the same time, and since we're studying the effect of these two grouping variables together, you can see that that one group was so much higher than the others that we wouldn't be able to test, that we wouldn't be able to really investigate if we were looking at these grouping variables separately. So here's another example. Uh, so this is what we were talking about before, so height as a function of gender and age. Uh, so as you can see, females are blue, males are orange and we have two different groups, less than 10 years old and more than 10 years old. So as you can see, if you're looking at just less than 10 years old, females are higher than males, and that makes sense. Uh, women uh, develop earlier, they get taller earlier than men, so therefore, uh, when you're looking at less than 10 years, females are taller than males. But then when you're looking at more than 10 years old, males catch up and become taller. Then you can see that the, uh, the differences flip. So therefore, females become shorter and males become taller when you're looking at more than 10 years old. And this is also interaction effect. Another way you can see interaction effects is when the effects flip, when they uh, switch sides based on what grouping variables you're looking at. So if you're looking at females versus males, females are taller when you're at less than 10 years old, but then the effect flips, and then suddenly males become taller when you're more than 10 years old. And this would be an interaction effect that if you're looking at just age and determining height, you wouldn't be able to understand this interaction. You wouldn't be able to understand this uh, flip uh, without looking at gender. So if you're just looking at age, you would miss this entirely. On the other hand, if you're just looking at gender, you also would miss this entirely. You also would just look at the results and think, oh, men are taller than women, and you would move on. But by performing a two-variable ANOVA, by having both the grouping variables of gender and also age, you can identify this interaction effect you can test for this interaction effect. You can see that the results flip based on what uh, the nature of the grouping variables. So there you go. If you uh, understand this, continue the video. As always, if you don't understand this, pause it, shoot me an email, and I'm happy to explain it. I'm happy to go over this with you. But if you get it, let's go ahead and continue. So how do we test this? And we still perform an ANOVA. We're going to do a two-variable ANOVA to test this. So when performing an ANOVA to test an interaction effect, our null and alternative hypotheses are usually the null is the effect of each variable does not depend on the other, and that's what we want to reject, hopefully. And then our hypothesis, or the alternative hypothesis, is the effect of each variable depends on the other. So that's going to be our hypothesis for this interaction effect. So to find an interaction effect, we really need to understand null is that it uh, does not depend on the other, whereas our hypothesis is that it does depend on the other. So we perform an ANOVA to determine whether we can reject the null hypothesis, and we still use p-values to do this. We still use p-values. Unfortunately, Excel will give us those p-values. So how do we perform an ANOVA? As I just said, we're going to use Excel. Uh, Excel actually is pretty bad at doing a two-variable ANOVA. Um, it's really clunky. There are certain multiple ways you could do a two-variable ANOVA in Excel, and I really don't like any of them. Uh, whenever I have to do a two-variable ANOVA, I always use a different program like SPSS, but we're going to just do the easiest way just to get an introduction into two-variable ANOVA. We're going to do the easiest way just to figure out uh, how to get a first taste of it, and then maybe later in the semester we'll come back and learn some of the more complicated, advanced ways to do a two-variable ANOVA. So this is what it might look like in Excel for a, your data for a two-variable ANOVA. So as you can see in this example, we have two different grouping variables, and each of those grouping variables have three groups. 
So we have group 1, group 2, and group 3 for one grouping variable, and we have group A, group B, and group C for the other grouping variable. So once again, one grouping variable is 1, 2, 3, the other grouping variable is A, B, and C. And as you can see, uh, two things you should notice about this is we have three participants for each of those combinations. So group 1A, so people that are both in group 1 and group A, there are three of those people and they had scores of 10, 7, and 10. Group 2A, so people in group 2 and group A, had 10, 2, and 10. And also people in group 3 uh, and group A were 9, 6, and 9, and so on and so on. So whenever you're doing a two-variable ANOVA, you should have participants that fall in each combination of these grouping variables. So therefore you have people that represent each possible combination. So you have people in group 1A, group 2A, group 3A, people in group 1B, group 2B, group 3B, and people in group 1C, group 2C, and group 3C. So we have people in all possible combinations of those. And how many total groups is that then? Hopefully you said it correctly, it's nine total groups. So we have nine total groups in this, and that's why we're doing an ANOVA. We have nine total groups. So even though we have two grouping variables of three groups each, three times three is nine, and that's how we get nine groups total. Okay, so to do this ANOVA, we're gonna go to data analysis, as always, and we're gonna click on ANOVA single factor with replication. Um, this is the easiest way to do it. It's not necessarily the best, but I think it's the easiest just to get an introduction to this concept. So we're going to push OK, and as always, we're going to click on Input Range. Uh, we're going to click on that button that's highlighted, and we're going to highlight our data. And this is very, very, very important. Make sure you do highlight those labels. Uh, this doesn't give us the option to check labels in first row. It's always just going to assume that we highlighted our labels, so make sure you highlight those labels. Make sure you do that. So highlight those labels and then push that other highlighted button. And then we're going to have the question rows per sample. That's just asking you how many participants you have in each group. So in this example, we're going to have three participants in each group. So we're going to have three rows per sample. So we have three participants in each group. So we have three rows per sample. So we highlight our data. We told it we have three participants in each group. And that's all we have to do. We actually are just going to go ahead and push OK. So this part of the analysis is pretty easy. However, we get this output, this huge monster of an output. Um, but we'll walk through it. It's not, that, it's not going to be that difficult. It's not going to be that complicated. Uh, so let's walk through it together. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this output. Um, so as you can see, this first row right here on the output at the bottom is called sample. So what this sample row is telling us is whether there's a significant difference between the groups that we labeled A, B, and C. So this is going to tell us whether there's a significant difference in whatever the grouping variable was that defined the rows. So in our grouping variable that defined the rows was the grouping variable that was group A versus group B versus group C. So this sample row is first going to tell us that the S statistic was 5.127. 5.127. So as always, we're going to need to report this test statistic. Uh, we're going to have to report our F statistic, but it doesn't really tell us much on its own. It's pretty hard to interpret. So as always, we're going to look at the p-value. So our p-value is 0 0.017. Is this statistically significant? So hopefully you looked at it and you said, yes, it is statistically significant because this p-value is less than 0.05. So this p-value is less than 0.05, so it was indeed statistically significant. So therefore we would say p less than 0.05 and there is indeed a statistically significant difference between that grouping variable that defined our rows. Between the grouping variable that was the group A versus group B versus group C, so that grouping variable that defined our rows was indeed statistically significant. There is indeed some type of difference between group A, group B, and group C. So therefore, in estimating the effect of variable uh, 1 or variable A versus B versus C, the test statistic was 5.127 and the p-value was 0 0.017, so p less than 0.05. So we know there's a significant effect of variable 1 and there was some type of difference between group A, group B, and group C. There's some type of difference between A, B, and C. Uh, we don't quite know what it was yet, but we know that there was some type of difference between A, B, and C. 
So the next one's a little bit easier to interpret. The next row in that ANOVA I'll put at the bottom is called columns. Uh, so we know that this is comparing the difference of whatever grouping variable to find our columns. So in this example, our columns grouping variable was the one that was group one versus group two versus group three. So whatever variable to find our columns is what this uh, output is now telling us whether it's significant or not. So this is the variable that defined group one versus group two versus group three. So as you can see, our columns F statistic was 1.9009. And as always, we need to report that. We need to understand that, but it doesn't tell us much. And the p-value was 0.178. So is this statistically significant, a p-value of 0.178? Hopefully you said no, because the p is greater than 0.05. So this was not statistically significant. So we would say that whatever variable we were looking at, that defined group one versus group two versus group three was not statistically significant. There's not an overall difference in the columns. There's not an overall difference in group one versus group two versus group three. So therefore, before we found that there was a difference between groups A, groups B, and group C, we would say that now that there's not a difference between group one, group two, and group three. So the columns are not statistically different, but those grouping variables defined by the rows, A versus B versus C, we found out before on the prior slides, those were different. So therefore, you can have one grouping variable that is statistically significant, and the other grouping variable might not be statistically significant. In this case, the grouping of A versus B versus C overall was significant, but one versus two versus three overall was not significant. And that's all this slide is saying, that in estimating the effect of variable two, the test statistic was 1.90, the p-value was 0.178, and the p was greater than 0.05. So we know that there was, was not a significant effect of variable two, and there was no significant difference between group one, group two, and group three. There was no significant difference between group one, group two, and group three. And then the very thing we wanna look at is the interaction. So the interaction right there, uh, the F statistic was 1.66. The F statistic was 1.66, and as always, we report it. But we also look at the p-value, and it was 0 0.202. Is this statistically significant? Hopefully you said no, because p is greater than 0 0.05. So we did not have a significant interaction. That uh, variable one, so the variable that determined the rows was significant. Uh, variable two, the variable that determined the columns was not significant, and there's no significant interaction. So this is saying that the two variables, the two grouping variables, do not depend on the other. One does not depend on the other. So variable one does not depend on variable two, and variable two does not depend on variable one. And that's all this slide is saying. That in estimating the interaction effect, the test statistic was 1.66, the p-value was 0.203, so p greater than 0.05. So therefore we know that there was not a significant interaction effect, and the effect of variable one did not depend on the effect of variable two. So let that sink in for a second. Uh, if this is confusing, uh, maybe replay the video, maybe pause it, maybe go back over it. As always, shoot me an email, but let's continue. So in this example, we can say that the only difference in the sampling, or sorry, we can only say that the only differences in the sample is among the group variable one groupings. So we can say that the only differences in the sample is among the variable one groupings. So whatever the row variable was. Not in the variable group two, which was the columns, or their interactions. So not in variable two or the interactions. So the only significant effect was variable one, which was the variable that defined the rows. But how do you know which one performed better? How do we know which of these groups performed better for the variable one groupings? Uh, Usually if you're doing this uh, in SPSS or other advanced packages, you would again perform post hoc tests. Uh, there's also things called planned comparison tests. Uh, you could use those. Those get extremely complicated, um, a little bit more advanced than what I really wanna cover in this class. We might come back to it at the end of the semester, maybe, but I don't think that's really necessary for us to learn this semester. So we're not gonna actually cover that. So instead, we're just gonna look at the means. So to determine which of these groups perform better, we're just gonna go ahead and look at the means when we're doing a two variable ANOVA. So when we're doing a one variable ANOVA, we will be using the post hoc test, we'll, we will be looking at that table, but when we're doing a two variable ANOVA, 
we're going to keep it simple for this class. We're just going to look at the means. And fortunately, our output previously gave us the means. We already had those means, so we don't have to calculate them again on our own. So before we have found out that, uh, that the grouping variable that determined our rows, the grouping variable that determined group A versus group B versus group C was statistically significant. So we can go ahead and look at their averages, which are highlighted right here, to determine uh, which groups had higher or lower value values. So as you can see, group B had the lowest, group C had the middle, and group A had the highest. So we could rank these groups. So we know that there's some type of difference among these groups. So now we could rank them and have a general idea of how they differed. So we generally know that B was the lowest, C was in the middle, and A was the highest. Just by looking at their means or their averages, that's provided by this ANOVA output. So therefore we know that A was 8.11, B was 3.89, and C was 6.22. So it seems that the mean order was group A, then group C, then group B from strongest to weakest, or from largest to smallest. But what would we do if variable two did have a significant interact, or so, sorry, but what would we do if variable two had a significant effect? So what if that grouping variable that determined our columns, group one versus group two versus group three, did have a significant effect? Fortunately, we could look at the same output. So as you can see, group one had a value of 5.22, group two had a value of 5.44, and group three had a value of 7.55. So if this was significant, we could look at the same output and we could determine the averages of the columns and we could determine the order of the groups. We could figure out what the order was of the groups if it was significant, because that would be meaningful then. But since it's not significant, we don't care as much. Uh, but we could still look at the output to determine the averages and the order from strongest to weakest. So in this example, group three had the strongest value followed by group two, and then followed by group one with the weakest. And then the last part, what would we do if there's a significant interaction effect? Once again, we would look at the same output because this also gives us the average for each combination of those groups. So this does give us the average for group 1A, group 2A, group 3A, uh, group 1B, group 2B, group 3B, and group 1C, group 2C, group 3C. So as you can see, group 1A had an average of 9, group 2A had an average of 7.33, and group 3A had an average of 8, and so on and so on. So if we had a significant interaction effect, we would look at all of these combinations and we would try to determine whether there was one of these groups that was indeed significantly larger than all the other ones. So there was not a significant interaction effect this time, but let's just go ahead and for practice take a look at this and see if you can find the largest group and also the smallest group of these nine. So did you find it yet? So the largest group was group 3C. So if you look at group 3C, that group had an average of 10. So if there was a significant interaction effect, it could have been because of that group. It could have been because that group had such a higher value than all the others. And then did you find the smallest one? Hopefully you found the smallest one, group 1C. That one had an average value of only three. That one had an average value of only three. So if you had a significant interaction effect, it could also be because of this group. It could also be because this group was so much smaller than all the others. So there you go. That's what you would look for if you had a significant interaction. You would look at all these means and you would try to pick out some that might be significantly smaller or significantly larger than all the others. Uh, like I said before, uh, if we were doing this 100% properly, we would run other statistical tests, such as post hoc tests, such as plan comparisons, but those get pretty complicated when you're doing a two-variable ANOVA. So we're probably not going to cover that in this class. We might come back to it at the end of the semester, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, but that's all for two-variable ANOVA. If you need any help with this, shoot me an email. I'm always available to help. Otherwise, go do the guides. Go look at the guides. See if you can figure those out. And then if you're still having trouble, let me know. But otherwise, that's all for ANOVA. That's all we're going to cover this week. So thank you for listening. Don't forget to do the guides, and please do not forget to do the homework. But otherwise, I will talk to you next week.